Good morning, everyone, and welcome to White Branch Church this morning. We're going to start our service off with some opening music. We're going to sing, Let's Just Praise the Lord.
All right. Everybody can be seated now. Um, today we have a special for you, and uh, it's called Peace. And Zeta is going to come up and sing that for you. So it may just take a second to get transitioned here.
scripture today is from Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was with child and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter and her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who, lived, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before our God day and night has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to, shir to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. Amen. Thank you, Karen, for doing the scripture reading today. So you may have thought you had a guest preacher. <laughs> Usually that's when I come up, but she read the scripture at Nettle Creek. I said, well, you can read it again at White Branch. So I had her do that. I wanted to give her another birthday present by letting her read in front of everybody. And uh, who knows, maybe I'll get some others of you to help me read some scripture in the future. So if I ask you... You will know I would like you to come up and read some scripture. So that, that was our scripture reading today. We're continuing our Revelation series. I wanted to start out with this. My father and old Mr. Adams have been arguing for 20 years, a man said to his friend. But they finally stopped. Why, asked his friend, did they bury the hatchet? No, they buried Mr. Adams. <laughs> One way to end an argument. <laughs> well, good morning. good morning. Good morning. We're looking today at the cosmic battle. And uh, throughout our lives, we hear about this. The story of good versus evil. It's in a lot of our movies, a lot of our books, a lot of our TV programs, a lot of the things we just naturally hear about or the things maybe we play when we're kids. We have a battle and there's a good side and there's a bad side. And the reason I think of that so much in the world is because it reflects the reality of what has been going on since the beginning of our time. We have this battle of good versus evil. And of course, we always want good to win out over evil. And I believe that's what Revelation shows us. That Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, wins out over evil and evil gets defeated. And then we enter into a time of peace and prosperity and blessing and righteousness after that time. And that's what I've been showing us in previous weeks later in the book of Revelation. But now I back this up to Revelation 12. Because in Revelation 12, it gives us a spiritual picture of different things that have been going on and will continue to go on until the end. So I want to look at this picture today and we think about Revelation. Revelation is a revealing it's a revealing of things, and a lot of it reveals what's going on in the spiritual world or what will take place. But here we really get to see what's going on in the spiritual world and how that affects us in our physical, natural world. 
And you may have heard the phrase, there's more than meets the eye. And that is absolutely true. Because there's more going on in our world than what we just see and sense with our physical senses. There is a spiritual world of things going on and it's affecting what takes place in our natural world. So what we see and what we sense is affected by what happens in the spiritual realm. So we look at this, Revelation 12, we go back to verse 1 here. It says, a great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of 12 stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Since I've never done that, I don't know what that feels like. <laughs> but I, I heard there's some pain involved. So number verse 3, then another sign appeared in heaven. Now I'm going to get back to the woman here in a minute. Because I want to talk about these symbols. And a lot of times in Revelation, we have these symbols. But if you keep reading, you can find out what these symbols are. Or you can get kind of close. Yes, sometimes there's some differences. And you might have two or three options. But a lot of times, if you keep reading, it actually shows you pretty clearly what these signs and symbols symbolize. So we look at this spiritual battle. We look at this cosmic battle of good versus evil. Let's look at these symbols that John is seeing revealed to him and what they mean for us. So verse 3, then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his heads. He swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child. Now let's look at this one. A son... A male child who will rule all the nations. Who do you think that is? <laughs> if you're in church, usually the best answer is Jesus, right? What was the sermon about? Jesus. What was the children's story about? Jesus. What did you learn in Sunday school? Jesus, right? So here, there is a male child, a son, who will rule all the nations. Jesus said in Matthew 28, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And then we see here again what I've talked about before. There will be a thousand year period where Jesus rules all the nations in his millennial reign. And I believe that the iron scepter there speaks of his absolute rule and authority. That no one else will be able to have rule and authority except him. And then her child was snatched up to God and to his throne. The Ascension. I've talked multiple times about trying to elevate Ascension Day and get us to remember Ascension Day more and more. We see that's where Jesus went back to God and where he is now at the right hand of the Father in heaven until he returns to the earth. And we talked about that in previous weeks. So the male child is Jesus, and he has absolute rule and power and authority, and he's snatched up to God, and that's where he is now, and one day he will return to rule here on the earth physically. So we have this male child. Now what about the dragon? Back to verse 3. Another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon, seven heads and ten horns. And we see here in verse 4, the dragon stood in front of the woman, who was about to give birth, so he might devour her child the moment it was born. Down to verse 9. Again, keep reading. A lot of this gets explained. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. So we see who the dragon is. Satan, the devil, leading the world astray. And we see that in Revelation 20. Again, we give all the same names in Revelation 20. So the great dragon, the Satan, or the devil, and he's leading the world astray. He was hurled to the earth with his angels. So there's other angels involved. Who are those other angels? Going back to verse 4. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. So we see stars mentioned here. A third of the stars. If you go back to Revelation chapter 1, verse 20. You see another image, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. So we see imagery here of stars with angels. We see Satan getting flung to the earth with his angels and it looks like a third of them fell. Or a third of the stars, a third of the angels fell with 
Satan, and they would be our demons today. And I believe that the good news is two-thirds are not fallen. So we have more on the side of good and more on the side of Jesus than are on the side of evil. But we have to recognize that there is a third of the angels, however many that is, that are on the side of evil, and they are still at work here on the earth. And they were flung to the earth and hurled to the earth. Now, there's three or four different opinions on when that took place. Is this a future event? Is this after or around the death, burial, resurrection, ascension? Or is it in the beginning before the garden? I'm going with the first one. Because in the garden, we start seeing the effect of the serpent or Satan there. And that's when he begins to speak to Eve. And we see the effects of demons on the earth from that time forward. And I believe continue until Jesus returns. And then at that point, we see him put Satan into an abyss for a thousand years. But right now we have this going on. So let's look at this next phrase. What is spiritual warfare? We see in verse 7, and there was war in heaven or in the spiritual realm. Okay, so we recognize here, if you talk about what is spiritual warfare, where do you get that idea? That sounds a little out there. <laughs> Revelation 12, 7, there was war in heaven. And Michael, which is one of the good angels, and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. We see there's a spiritual war going on. There is a cosmic battle between good and evil. Michael and his angels, Satan and his angels, and they are fighting. So we have to recognize there is a spiritual battle. It is real and it is happening. But we see here, verse 8, what side wins? He was not strong enough, Satan, and they lost their place in heaven. And the great dragon was hurled down, and the ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. So what is one of his key tactics? To lie and lead people astray and to deceive. He is the liar as Jesus said in John 8, 44, when he lies, he speaks his native language. So he wants to lie and lead people astray, and he is a deceiver, and that is one of the tactics he uses in this spiritual battle. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. So what's going on in the spiritual realm affects what's going on in the physical realm. Go back to verse for now, his tail swept a third of the angels out of the sky. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so he might devour her child the moment it was born. Why? Because in Genesis 3, God gave a promise and said, the seed of the woman is going to crush your head, serpent, and your seed is going to strike his heel. So this spiritual battle was declared in Genesis 3.15 and the dragon ever since then or Satan has been looking for the opportunity to devour this child. Another thing about him, he's not only a liar, he is a murderer, as Jesus said, and he's a murderer from the beginning. He is to steal and to kill and to destroy. And so we see that he is ready to destroy this child the moment it is born. It's like the opposite of an OB, right? The child's about to be born. There'll be doctors there ready to help the child to be born and to start their life. But here we have the dragon ready to take that child and to kill it as soon as it's born. Now, we don't see that right away in the biblical story. They have the angels when Jesus is born. You have the shepherds come. But what happens within at least the first year or two? Magi come. They come from the east, they talk to Herod, and they say, where is this child who's been born king of the Jews? And they seek the scriptures and say, oh yeah, he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. And they send them on their way. And what does Herod say? When you find the child, let me know so I too can go and worship him. And that was not his intention at all. He wanted to kill that boy because he didn't want a rival to his throne. But what's behind Herod here? What's behind Herod is Satan who wants to kill the child. Because Satan and the spiritual realm, they have to find willing vessels on the earth to carry out their plans. So they want to find people that they can give their lives to and give their thoughts to so they can be influenced to carry out their plan. And Herod was a willing vessel. 
Herod was sinful. Herod was selfish. Herod was hateful. And guess what? Satan found a willing vessel. I'm going to use this king to destroy that child. Because Satan is not a physical being. He needed to find a physical being to work through. So he was looking for someone. He found Herod, and Herod now is enraged and ready to kill that child. So the angels come and say, don't go back to Herod. Go another way in a dream. And they show up to Joseph in a dream and say, get out because Herod wants to kill your child. So they go down to Egypt. But there are still babies there in Bethlehem. Two years old or younger, males, and all of them get killed. What's going on here is the spiritual realm affecting the physical, and we have a battle on earth because of the battle in heaven. So if you're wondering why so many bad things happen on the planet today, one, because God has, at this time, hurled down Satan and his demons, and they are here, and they are affecting this planet. God obviously eventually will remove them. He will judge them. We see that at the end of Revelation. But for now, he's still allowing them to exist and have influence. And then you have willing vessels. You have human beings who are willing to listen and choose evil. And we see that play out in our earth. And this is why I don't think we are going to see peace on earth until the return of Jesus. We are to be people of peace. We are to proclaim peace. We are to show peace. But I don't believe we are going to see peace on earth. Why? Because you have a spiritual battle affecting the physical. We have physical battles going on. So we have this spiritual battle that's going on. And he is working through evil ones. Let's talk a little bit more about the spiritual warfare. And our role and how we are to respond. In verse 10, I heard a loud voice from heaven say, Now have come the salvation, the power, and the kingdom of our God, the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, it's another role of Satan. He has lots of different titles because he has lots of different things that he does. He is a liar and a deceiver. He is a murderer and a killer. And he is an accuser. In fact, the Hebrew word for ha-Satan means the Satan, which means the accuser. That's one of his roles. And he accuses them before our God day and night. He is an accuser of the brethren. He is an accuser of the believers. So one of the things we have to do in our spiritual battle is we have to fight those accusations that we have feel. Obviously, it says here he accuses them before God. And we see that in the book of Job, for example. Satan shows up in the book of Job and accuses Job before God. It's like a prosecuting attorney. And the prosecuting attorney's job is to show how guilty that other person is. And he's got a lot of evidence to work with in our lives. How many of us have sins we could name? And he will get accused and accused and accused and accused. And when he likes to turn that accusation around to us as well. And not just accuse us before God, but accuse ourselves so that we then feel unworthy. And then we no longer feel like we are righteous. And we begin to believe things that are lies of the evil one instead of the truth of the word of God. And this is why we need to be grounded in the truth of how we are righteous. Because if we think we are righteous by our own ability, our own merits, our own behavior, then when we get those accusations, what's going to happen? We'll believe the lie. You're right, I'm not righteous. You're right, I am guilty. You're right, I am condemned. You're right, I am a terrible Christian. You're right, I shouldn't be believing that God loves me and accepts me as who I am. But Romans 8 one says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So we don't stand before God and say, I'm going to be righteous on my own. We stand before God and say, I'm going to be righteous because of what Jesus did. Because of his blood. Because of what he's done for me. And that's why we need to know the truth, as Jesus said in John. And when we know the truth, it'll set us free. So when the accuser comes to accuse, we need to be able to stand for the truth and believe the truth and speak the truth. We're also called to speak the truth to others, to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim the good news. He says, verse 11, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb 
or by what Jesus did for us, by him making us righteous, and by the word of their testimony. They overcame him. What's another way we overcome the evil one in the spiritual battle is by sharing the good news with others. And by preaching and teaching that truth so that others can get set free and they too can come out of the grip of the evil one and into the kingdom of God. And then this third one here, they did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. It's actually the fourth one on my list, how to win the spiritual battle. Prepare for persecution. Death and martyrdom. What does martyrdom actually mean? Martyr means to be a witness. And we use it now, witness who's willing to give their life to death. And this is an odd way of winning a spiritual battle. We don't think of winning a battle by, by dying. But Jesus won the battle by dying, and he encourages his followers to share in his path. Take up your cross, follow me. And throughout the centuries, from the first century on, and it'll intensify, obviously, in the end, there is a persecution against God's people. The first century, followers of Jesus were persecuted for their faith. And remember, Revelation was written to a group of people that were being persecuted for their faith. And he's saying, I want you to realize that you are winning the battle, but you're not winning it the way you think you're winning it. So many of us think we win it when we see physical evidence of winning. And with this theme of God's victorious church, a lot of what I've been doing this year is helping us realize what the real truth is. God's church is victorious. We are the winners. It might not always look that way in the physical realm. And for a while, it looked like the church was losing. And in the end, it's going to look like the church is losing for a while when the Antichrist is killing God's people. But he's saying they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. And I believe in every generation there are people who have to give their life for Jesus. Thankfully, in America, we've not had to. I praise God for that. But you don't have to look too far to see people who have in our generation... Our Nigerian brothers and sisters have had to give their lives. There are people in China who risk their lives. There are people in Muslim countries who risk their lives for following Jesus. Next one. Put on the spiritual armor. Let's go to Ephesians 6, 10 to 18. Ephesians 6. And we see the spiritual armor. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Why? He's wanting you to get ready for a spiritual fight. And when you get ready for a spiritual fight, you want to be strong and believe in the mighty power that's on your side. Verse 11, it says, put on the full armor of God so you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And there's two ways to pack if you're going on a trip. One is to pack like you're going on a vacation. If you pack like you're going on a vacation, you're probably going to bring things that help you have fun and feel comfortable and enjoy your life. But if you're packing like you're going in a battle, you're going to pack some different items. And you're going to have a different mindset in your destination. If you're going on a vacation or you're being sent as a soldier, it's two different ideas. If you know you're going into battle, it's going to be different than going on a vacation. And what he's telling us here as believers, we need to prepare ourselves for the battle and not think life's just one long vacation. And if we think life's supposed to be one long vacation, that's one of the reasons we're so disappointed. Oh man, life's hard. This is bad. Why does that have to happen? Why am I dealing with this evil and that tragedy? <laughs> Actually, Jesus said in this world, you will have trouble. John 16, 33. But he said, you can take heart because I've overcome the world. So if we prepare ourselves for the devil and his schemes and his strategies and the evil that we're facing, and we come ready for it, it's going to be a whole lot different. So what should we pack or what should we put? The full armor of God. Verse 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood. In other words, we're not just engaged in a physical battle here. There's something behind that. Our struggle is actually against the rulers, the authorities, the powers of this dark world, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's where our real battle is. Now they will be happy to use and influence human beings. 
But if that human being is taken out of the way, they'll find another one. Which is why it never works to just work on the physical, because there's always the spiritual that's there. So 13, put on the full armor of God. So when, not if, but when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. After you've done everything, to stand. You keep seeing this word here, stand, stand, stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. That's not a physical thing. I don't put on a physical belt of truth. This is a spiritual piece of the armor, the belt of truth. And we have to know the truth because the evil one is a liar and he wants to deceive. So we have to know truth. With their feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace and the breastplate of righteousness. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which we can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then prayer. Pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert. Always keep on praying for all the saints. So I'm not getting into the details of all the armor today. That's not my main point. But I do want you to see that we have to put the armor on and we have to be ready for a spiritual fight. And we're ready for a spiritual fight and we do the things that God told us to by getting in the truth and having the word of God and praying and standing on the righteousness of Christ and sharing the good news of peace. Then we're going to see success in the spiritual battle. Back to 12. 12, 12. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth, woe to the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury because he knows that his time is short. He's got a sentence coming. And he's read this book too, okay? And he knows it better than a lot of us do. <laughs> he knows what's coming for him. And it's not good. But he's got a short time to be as evil and nasty and hateful and destructive as he can. And he's intense about it. So a lot of us go throughout our day and we don't realize the intensity the evil one is putting into this. He's not slacking. He's not saying, well, I'll just take a few years off and just let, let good things happen for a while. He is intense. And as the time gets closer, his intensity gets stronger. And when the dragon has been hurled down to earth, he pursued the woman. We have given birth to the male child. Let's talk about this one more time, the woman. There are three ideas, I guess, out there, but in, in, in my mind, one makes the most sense. The other two don't. One was Mary because she physically gave birth to Jesus. One is the church because they're the bride of Christ, the people of God. And one is Israel, our faithful Israel. And I think that one makes the most sense because it represents, I think, a group of people and Israel gave birth to Jesus. The church didn't give birth to Jesus, or the other way around. So we see here this woman who had given birth to the male child. The woman, verse 14, was given two wings of a great eagle, so she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert, where she'd be taken care of for a time, times, and half a time. And most people associate that with the same thing in verse 6. Verse 6, the woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. So if it says 1,260 days in verse 6, then in verse 14 it seems to make sense time, times, and half a time. It's the same idea for three and a half years. And both of them say out of the serpent's reach or where she might be taken care of by God. Now is the wings of the eagle... Is that straight metaphor? Or does it indicate maybe a flying device? I don't know. At least the flying devices are available now. <laughs> they weren't in the first century. But now there is ways to transport people in a device that flies. Either way, there's going to be this intense desire to persecute the Jewish faithful. And then they will be protected 
for this three and a half year period. Out of reach, out of sight. One of the ways that might happen, I'm going to give you a possibility. I'm not saying for sure. Go to Matthew chapter 25. Matthew 25. See, there's these parables speaking of final judgment and different things to come. The third one here is the sheep and the goats, Matthew 25, 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, so now we're talking about the return, and the angels with him, and he'll sit on his throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right hand, the goats on his left, and the king will say to those on the right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. And the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? So obviously this isn't directly the person of Jesus that he's referring to here. 40, the king will reply, tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers of mine, you did for me. And a lot of us, and I think rightly, you know, apply this to everybody. And one of the least of these, I've just sharing my love for Jesus, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but I just want to show you another possibility. When he says, brothers of mine, and Jesus was a Jewish man, and we're heading into the final judgment here. So it's possible that there are Gentiles, Maybe Gentile believers at that time, maybe not Gentile believers at that time. I, I'm not going to guess all the details and say for sure. I've heard some different opinions, but it could be that these Gentile people, whether believers or not, help these Jews at that time and protect them from the Antichrist. As we've seen some people do in the past. Think of Nazi Germany. And think of Hitler and his attack on the Jews. And there were some people who stood against that. There were some Germans who helped their Jewish Germans and protected them and stopped them and helped them from this persecution. So I believe a similar thought may occur here in this three and a half year period. There may be some Gentile believers or Gentile nations that decide they're going to help and not go along with the thought of the Antichrist to kill and persecute these people. And that may be one of the ways they're protected during that time. Either way, we see for three and a half years, they are protected. And I believe they're the ones that go on in, in this natural body, into the millennial reign with Jesus. And they go into that time with this body, not the glorified one. So we see here now, the woman was given two wings to fly to the desert. She might take care of her time, times and half a time out of the serpent's reach. So another way I believe we win the spiritual battle in any generation, in any season, is to bless and protect and help Jewish people from anti-Semitism and persecution. We see that happen during... Nazi Germany, we see that will happen in the end times, and I believe if we see that happening, we are to step up and help. That that will be a blessing to God as we do that. 16, but the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the river that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. And the dragon was enraged at the woman, 17, and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. So we see that the devil hates God's people. And he wants to steal and kill and destroy them. And he is at war with them. But in the midst of all this, I want you to remember one thing. My theme for the year. Jesus and his church wins. Matthew 16, 18. Remember, Jesus said... I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. The gates of hell 
will not win against what I am building. So my challenge for you, choose one of the five ways to engage in and win the spiritual battle this week. Maybe you need to speak more truth, read more of the scripture, stand more on the word of God, be more bold in your witness for the faith, and look for places where you can help other people that are suffering, help other people that are being persecuted for their faith, help other people that are standing in this spiritual battle and it's physically costing them their life right now. Or at least recognize them in prayer because we know prayer is one of the elements we can use in this spiritual battle. Let's pray together. God, we come to you now in the name of Jesus and we thank you that you have put us on the winning side of this spiritual battle through the blood of Jesus. And God, we thank you. We've been so blessed in America for all of our lives here to have freedom of worship and freedom to proclaim what we believe and freedom from this intense type of a persecution. But God, we know there are believers around the world this very day that have their life on the line for trusting in you. God, we want to support them and encourage them and pray for them and bless them. And we know, God, that through the blood of Jesus and through the word of their testimony, they overcome. And we pray, God, that they would be willing to lay down their life and not love their life unto death. As you said, God, in your word, that those who want to save their life in this world will lose it, but those who are willing to lose their life will gain it. And God, I pray that whatever we face here in this nation in the years to come, that we would be willing to live for you and be a bold witness. And God, I pray that we would take a step this week to participate in the spiritual battle whatever way you desire us to. And maybe some of us here today, we need to take that first step. Say, I want Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. I want to be forgiven of my sin. I want to live for you. I want to trust your blood and your righteousness for the rest of my life. God, we thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. all please stand. Hopefully Jim can get this on here. <laughs> We're going to sing as the deer.
So be blessed with the Holy Spirit this week. As you engage in the spiritual battle around you, receive the strength and the power and the grace of God. God bless you. Thank you.